uh, this program is presented by Santa Clara County Poet Laureate, Janice Lobo Sapigal, uh, the Santa Clara County Library District, Poetry Center San Jose, and Silicon Valley Creates. Before we really kick it off for the night, um, I just want to first uh, do the proper uh, cultural protocol of acknowledging the land that we are gathered on for this commencement ceremony. Um, as an indigenous person from the island of Samoa, from the Pacific Islands in Oceania, um, it's always right to acknowledge the fact that uh, we are on stolen occupied land, um, primarily uh, and particularly unceded Mu Muekma Ohlone land here in the Bay Area. And so we named that, I named that as a way to be specific about the fact that indigenous people, native people of this land are currently still here, still fighting for their right towards their indigenous sovereignty, um, that we move as a community and reckon with what it means to be on occupied land. Um, what is our, our job as artists, as creatives, as educators, who do programming around community and what does that mean to be in community with the, the stewards of this land um, in their efforts um, towards justice and towards indigenous sovereignty. And so we hold that with us tonight in this commencement ceremony and always. Um, before we kick it off, let me introduce myself. My name is Teresa Siangatonu. I go by she, her pronouns, and I am a fellow poet alongside all of our youth poets tonight. Uh, 15 years ago, I was 18 years old when I was in my college dorm room at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I had just graduated from Lee High School in San Jose, California. Um, and I did all of my formal education in San Jose when I wrote my first poem um, in college. And 15 years later, I haven't stopped. <laughs> um, poetry, spoken word um, was the vehicle I used to really um, understand what my voice was made for and what my purpose in life was going to be. Um, long after college ended. And so through getting involved in um, youth programming through Youth Speaks um, here in the Bay Area, being a poet mentor, being a youth poetry slam coach, um, and also coaching college teams, and as well as competing on, on teams at, on a national level, I learned through this art form um, just how transformative it was to not just my life, but to my commitment to this community that I share with all of you. And no one has taught me the power of poetry more than young people, more than youth poets. From starting out as a youth poet myself to becoming a mentor of youth poets today, um, I think youth are the best of us. And I think how we treat young people and how we treat um, youth power and, and youth voice is the kind of culture we get. <laughs> and so I'm just so honored to be the host for tonight's commencement ceremony. Um, and to really just ground our space in the tradition of the word, of the spoken word, I do want to offer up a poem, if that's okay with folks. Um, and so I know everyone's tuning in virtually, but I really do encourage folks to utilize the chat. If you're feeling anything that you're resonating with throughout the night, if you're um, feeling, you know, like you're resonating with any of the words that I say or any of the fellow artists perform tonight, um, throw it up in the chat. Um, show love as best as you can, because a lot of the energy we get is from the audience but because we can't be together in person we got to do what we got we got to do what we got to do with and make do with uh the chat feature and so um if you're feeling it uh give give love give affirmations and whatnot but this first poem i share as today is the first day of asian american pacific islander heritage month um, and as a proud pacific islander i know that oftentimes when i ask folks if they have ever met or if they are in community with Pacific Islanders, um, more often than not, their touch points into my community is through the media, through Hollywood entertainment, uh, maybe through athletics, uh, maybe through their experience with vacationing on our islands, right? And so I know that a lot of what I do with writing is to really reclaim that narrative and tell my story and tell the story of my people so that else has to tell it for us and so that um, no one um, has to misunderstand who we are as a people and so I'm reminded all the time that I come from people who are the pioneers of navigation um, and something that I hold dear to my heart is something that Hawaiian activist scholar Hanani K. Trask teaches where she says upon the survival of the Pacific depends the survival of the world. If you open up any atlas and take a look at a map of the world, almost every single one of them slices the Pacific Ocean in half. 
To the human eye, most maps center all land masses on earth, creating the illusion that water can handle the butchering and be pushed to the edges of the world, as if the Pacific Ocean isn't the largest body living today, beating the loudest heart, the reason why land has a pulse in the first place, the audacity one must have to create a visual so violent as to assume that nobody comes from water, so nobody will care what you do with it. And yet people came from land are still coming from land and look what was done to them. When people ask me where I'm from, they don't believe me when I say water. So instead I tell them that home is a machete and I belong to places that don't belong to themselves anymore. Broken and butchered places that have made me a hyphen of a woman, a Samoan American that carries the weight of both colonizer and colonized, both blade and blood, California stolen, Samoa sliced in half stolen, California nestled on the Western coast of the most powerful country on the planet, Samoa, an island so microscopic on a map, it's no wonder people doubt its existence. California, a state of emergency away of having the drought rid it of all its water. Samoa, a state of emergency away of becoming a saltwater cemetery if the sea levels don't stop rising. So when people ask me where I'm from, what they want is to hear me speak of land. What they want is to know where I go once I leave here. The privilege of assuming that home is just a destination and not the panic, not the constant migration that the panic gives birth to. What is it like to know that home is something that is waiting for you to return to it? What does it mean to belong to something that isn't sinking? What does it mean to belong to the very thing that is causing the flood? So many of us come from water. But when you come from water, no one believes you. Colonization keeps laughing. Global warming is grinning all at your grief. How you mourn the loss of a home that isn't even gone yet, that no one believes you're from. How everyone is beginning to hear more about your islands, but only in the context of vacations and honeymoons, football and military life, exotic women, exotic beaches, exotic fruit, but never asks about the rest of its body, the water the islands in them, the reasons why they're sinking. No one visualizes the Pacific Islands as actually being there. You explain and explain and clarify and fix their incorrect pronunciation and explain till they realize just how vast your ocean is, how microscopic your islands look in them, how easy it is to miss when looking on a map of the world, excuses people make for why they didn't see it, before. And <laughs> I hope you are still with me. I hope you're, you're, you're feeling the energy of what tonight is about. Thank you so much for letting me share that piece. Right now, I want to kick it over to my good sis, to our current um, Santa Clara County Poet Laureate, Janice Lobo Sapigao, who will be talking a little bit more about what a Poet Laureate even does. What does it mean? Um, <laughs> And, and give love to all the people who've made tonight possible. So please give it up for Janice and chat. <laughs> yes, thank you, Teresa. Oh my God. Your poems are always grounding. Um, and I'm really thankful that you are here tonight. So my first shout out is to you actually. So thank you for being here. Um, I am Janice Lobos of Pigal, the current uh, Santa Clara County Adult Poet Laureate is what I like to tell people. And I'm, I want to like thank so many people, um, but first I want to say that what I've learned about a Poet Laureate is that um, Poets Laureate were usually marked by having crowns of laurels. And so laurels are like bay leaves or any kind of leaf that comes from the Mediter Mediterranean. Um, and so in some ways, laurel crowns are flower crowns. <laughs> and so to me, I really love that because I want poems to bloom, right? I want poems to grow and I want um, youth poets to be like the seeds for our future of Santa Clara County. Um, and so I just wanna say like a youth poet laureate will do what they want to do with this position. 
Um, there's no set of rules. Um, I think the only rule is like make them for yourself. And, um, and if I could impart some knowledge, it would be to make sure to name and bring your community with you. Um, and that's something that I really wanted to do in this position is to sort of name a community or a population who I think really needs to be heard in poetry. Um, so a youth poet laureate does whatever they want to do. <laughs> Um, and, you know, because of so many people who have brought this program here, like, um, I want to just thank people. Um, Urban Word New York City, they uh, put together the National Youth Poet Laureate Initiative. So Santa Clara County is one of over 70 chapters of Youth Poets Laureate. This is the nation's largest literacy movement. Um, and it is what brought youth poets like Amanda Gorman to the inauguration stage. Um, and so our Youth Poet Laureate could possibly become the West Coast Regional Youth Poet Laureate, could possibly become the next National Youth Poet Laureate. So, you know, a lot of people have really tended to this garden of what it means to have a Youth Poet Laureate. Um, and so I want to say thank you to them. Thank you to the Academy of American Poets, who is like, funded this program in this first year by um, giving me a fellowship to be a Poet Laureate Fellow. Um, so I really want to make sure that fellowship funding goes back into the community. Um, I definitely would not be here without a team of volunteers. So I might, I'm, I, I just want to name as many people as I can. Um, Scorpiana Excellent, who is here, Sophia Smith, Carla Santiago Reyes, Amy Meyer, Lisa Medley, Shaka Campbell, Poetry Center in San Jose, Robert Pesich, um, so many people, Mike McGee, like have just like come through and helped and offered things in so many ways over the past year. So I really just want to say thank you for volunteering and trying to figure out with me how to do this. Um, I want to thank all of the judges. Um, Y'all are going to get time to be like shouted out later, but I just want to say um, because of your process of selection and the time you spent reading hundreds of poems um, and making the difficult choice to choose 10 students and then down into one, right? Like that's not easy. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, to all the writing workshop instructors, um, Kay Ming Chang, Jarvis Subia, um, Mike McGee, Lorenz Demuk, um, and then Jessica Gutierrez. I just want to say thank you for putting together the writing workshops where over 170 youth came through on Zoom on a Friday night to come and write and create with us. So thank you so much um, for leading all of those spaces. Thank you to the librarians, the teachers. Thank you to Martha Street Zine, who will be publishing youth poetry um, in a special edition just for youth. Um, the San Jose Museum of Art has been super helpful in this process and like allowing me to bring more youth through the doors. Um, all of the readers and writers from our December kickoff, um, a lot of help from the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate Program. Um, the Poets Laureate Council. I'm the sixth person. There are five before me, Nils Peterson, Sally Ashton, David Perez, uh, Arlene Biala, and Mighty Mike McGee. Like, I'm just number six. There will be, hopefully, hundreds more. Uh, and then also, also, thank you to the youth who have, like, come by. And I always wanted this program when I was younger. And in some ways, like, I have it, you know? Um, so I just want to say I'm so grateful to be a part of that process. Lastly, um, before I read a poem, one of our finalists, Margaret May, uh, was no longer able to continue. Um, there are other priorities, which I fully support that they take on. Our young people have so many opportunities afforded to them. And so I just want to say a shout out to Margaret May for going through the process, making the decision. And yeah, all the claps and love for you. Um, and, you know, there are many more years to come. So, okay, that's all I'm going to say. If I forgot someone, I'm really sorry. I'm tired. <laughs> um, but here's my poem, which I actually wrote in a workshop um, that Kay Ming Chang led for the students. <laughs> so this poem is called Venus after Fatima Askar's Pluto. <laughs> And, um, you know, you can feel energy from people. So imagine a planet, like you can feel the energy from a planet. Okay, here we go. A poem as Venus. Everyone sexualizes my curves, says I am attached to Mars, but the last time I checked, I was my own planet, held my own in the galaxy, carried my own weight in this bitch, no offense, son. 
played no moon to no one's sun, no offense moon. I am a sulfuric ocean to my own molten waters. Everyone on earth thinks I belong to someone else. Everyone convinced themselves Mars is the hot one, but I am the hellish one. I'm volcanic. My skin is permeable, but not impenetrable. I'm a 10 times 10 times 10. That's 1000 degrees. My skin glows and you call it gas, but I call it glistening, shining. I'm named after a Greek goddess. The only female here in this sausage party, in this meat market, in this boys club, the first lady of the solar system, the queen of the constellation, I am the second brightest of the bunch. Your morning star, your evening glory, I am a greenhouse. A day with me is longer than your year. All the mathematicians track my body. All the astronomers watch me move. All the philosophers think about me all the time. Tell the cartographers, I said, no paparazzi, please. How many space agencies have spent their money waiting to see me spin? How many men have tried to resist spending government dollar bills? How many politicians would throw down a stimulus check for the burn of this good gravity wave? I used to be water and land and air. I used to be like Brother Earth, but you won't get to my heart by orbiting my surface. Don't you know, you have to last longer than 127 minutes. You have to really withstand what all the spacecraft never could. I will melt your armor with a graze. I will incinerate your steel if you try it. What is the formula to cage an inferno? You will never know. Your machines won't satisfy your craving. You'll never get close to my winds because you can't come for me. Thank you. <laughs> I wanna to toss it back to Teresa. Thank you, Kimmy Chang for the poem and I'm excited for the youth poets tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! Can everyone please, if you are tuning in, give love to Janice in the chat right now. Fire emojis. Uh, all of the all of the love, y'all. Please, thank you so much, Janice, for offering up that poem. But also, thank you so much for naming so many people who made this night possible. Um, I think everything has a genealogy, including this program, and it's only it, only right to give love and give acknowledgement to everyone in the village who ma who made it possible for us to be in community tonight. So, thank you, Janice, for that. Um, right. Now, before we get to the highlight of the night, which is our Youth Poet Laureate finalists, um, I do want to give more acknowledgement to a few people who also made tonight possible, um, who are going to take some time to share more about how to support their work and support um, this Youth Poet Laureate program specifically. So first up, I want to introduce both Sophia Smith, who's a volunteer and organizer and teen poet, as well as Scorpiana Excellent. And they're going to be talking about what it was like working on this program this year. So please give it up. For Sophia and Scorpiana. Excellent. You want to go first? Sure. I just want to start by thanking all of the people I've worked with because everyone on the team was just so dedicated and passionate and not only talented writers but genuinely wonderful people and it's been a pleasure working with all of you. Um, I think to me this program has been a refuge from the STEM-centered environment and my school and finding a community where writing is valued has been so beautiful, and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, I've loved coordinating with all the people on the board, running workshops and learning and helping set up this program. I've seen so many dedicated poets in the workshops and also in this area. Um, and I'm really excited to see what these finalists and what the eventual Youth Poet Laureate does. Thank you. Yeah. Um... She said it all. No, um, adding on to that, like, thank you so much to Janice for deciding that, you know, we've gone too many years without there being a Youth Poet Laureate program and putting in, like, the work to organize this. Um, it's been, like, an amazing experience. Um, I look forward to like our Tuesday meetings every week um just getting to work with a bunch of really incredible people um one of the things I really love too about working on the committee 
was the fact that some of our volunteers were youth poets themselves. Um, because I really feel like you can't say, oh, I'm starting a program for youth. If you're not getting like input from youth and youth aren't participating in creating it. So, um, and honestly, that was one of my favorite parts of all this is um, the constant weekly reminder that um, our youth are amazing. Like if they are our future and they are the generation that's going to take over, I feel like we're going to be in a really good place. Like we're really, really fortunate. So um, yeah, I just feel really grateful to have the opportunity to work with all these amazing people and to get a few weeks ago to meet all the finalists and get to work with them a little bit. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Please give it up for Sophia and Scorpiana. Excellent, y'all. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with what it was like working on this program this year. Next up, I wanna introduce Don Phillips, a librarian from Milpitas Library and Santa Clara County Library District, who's gonna be talking about the youth and teen programming information for this upcoming summer. So please give it up, show some love for Don Phillips. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, exciting for me to be here. I, I like uh, being in the background better, but thank you for this moment. Um, uh, before I went into the what's going on at the library, I, I just wanted to acknowledge what Janice has done here. I think, you know, whenever you bring life to something that's new, it's a it's it's a tough process, and it's like pushing a boulder up a hill. And Janice has has been there from day one, pushing hard and and making that boulder go up, and she's gotten it up there. And uh, I think that's an incredible thing. I, I think you know it's a Herculean effort that she's put in, and I, I, I admire this, and I think this is such an awesome program. And um, I also am thankful we, um, in the Santa Clara County Library System, we've um, been having a poetry contest for 15 years now, um, something much smaller than this. It's just uh, writing a few poems and submitting them to the library for publishing. But uh, this year we've had hundreds of entries, and I have to think that maybe it had something to do with uh, this program as well, uh, the interest that we've had. So we're really appreciative and we're excited about it. And thank you for emphasizing poetry so much for teens and youth, uh, Janice, uh, it means a lot. Uh, that program just, uh, we just accepted our last entries at the end of April. Uh, we are heading into the summer reading in June. That is our next big program that's going on for teens. There will be lots of activities and lots of chances to share your thoughts about what you're reading and uh, to hopefully read some really good new books as well. And that'll be happening from uh, June to July in the library. And we're always coming up with virtual programs like this. And this has been a wonderful thing and uh, we're appreciative and, and thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Please give it up for Don, y'all. If you want to learn more about how to get involved in the youth and teen programming, visit sccld.org. I believe folks are also sharing these links in the chat as well, but that is the, the link to check out if you want to see how to get more involved. Next up, I want to introduce Robert Pesich, who is the president of Poetry Center San Jose. Um, they're going to talk about the upcoming events as well, as well as the future of our Youth Poet Laureate program, and also how you can donate to Poetry Center San Jose, which is also really important. So please show some love and give it up for Robert Pesich. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you so much. And Poetry Center San Jose is honored and is looking forward to continuing the Youth Poet Laureate program as sponsor in 2022. And uh, to support this program with donations, visit pcsj.org and select donate. And uh, remember to note your donation as YPL. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, so all contributions are tax deductible and we're going to be uh, really going forward with great 
enthusiasm in 2022 to make this uh, a continuing reality what uh, Janice Lobo Sapika has created and all the uh, wonderful volunteers. Upcoming Poetry Center San Jose programs, uh, well, San Jose Poetry Slam, May 9th, 6.30 p.m., featuring Janice Lobo Spigal. <laughs> so give it up. <laughs> All right, yeah. So uh, we're looking forward to that event. And then also Well Read Reading, May 11th, 7 p.m. That is co-sponsored by Works San Jose Art and Performance Center, featuring the new editors of Sejura. So tune in for that at 7 p.m. And then our new program, Beautiful Black Books, on Juneteenth. That's June 19th, right? Featuring Shaka Campbell as host in conversation with Dr. Donnie Jackson. So that's going to be, yeah, <laughs> I see Teresa clapping there. That's going to be at 7 p.m. So look forward to seeing you all at our programs in the coming weeks and months. And now back to Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Please show some love for Robert in the chat, y'all. And truly, you know, I don't, I can't emphasize enough how important donations are, especially from the community. Um, as someone who was is the co-founder of a poetry venue in the Bay Area in Oakland called The Root Slam, um, so much of how we ran and how we could even survive is through the love and support of donations from community. And so please really consider that if you have the means that uh, you can donate at pcsj.org. Um, and also the programming sound incredible. Check out Janice's feature next Sunday <laughs> at the Slam. Check out all of the upcoming programs that, that were listed um, prior, prior to this. Um, awesome. So last but not least, before we get into the main event of the night, which is our, our Youth Poet Laureate finalists, um, I wanna introduce Alyssa Erickson, who is the program manager from Silicon Valley Creates. And Alyssa is gonna talk about the support for the program and Poet Laureate, as well as the Youth Poet Laureate role. So please give it up for Alyssa. Hi everyone, I'm super happy to be here. Um, SV Creates is the County of Santa Clara's um, local arts partner. Um, and as part of that, we manage the um, application and selection process for the um, Santa Clara County Poet Laureate. Um, it's a two year term. So every two years we are out there encouraging new poets to apply to come into the position. Um, we couldn't be more thrilled with the work Janice has done in this really extraordinary year. It's a two year term, but I know it goes super fast. And um, Janice was so determined to make this Youth Poet Laureate program a reality. And I just can't um, thank her enough for the work she's done. I also really want to appreciate um, Poetry Center San Jose. Um, Janice has spearheaded it this year, but it's not something she can keep doing every year. She doesn't have the ability to do that. And Poetry Center San Jose has agreed to take up the mantle with the support of lots of other people. But I just really want to thank Poetry Center San Jose for stepping into that. So um, Janice, thank you for the work you've done with youth this year. I know it was super important for you to make those connections and um, it's just been extraordinary. So congratulations. Um, I'm so excited to honor the first Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate and hopefully see many more to come. So thanks so much, everybody. Yay, thank you so much, Alyssa. Please show some love for Alyssa in the chat, y'all. Um, and just to reiterate, Silicon Valley Creates supports cultural workers and artists in the South Bay. And so if you wanna get down with how to support that, as go to svc or no svcreates.org. Um, thank you again, Alyssa. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, um, the reason why we're all gathered tonight, um, I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce our 2021 Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalists. So please give love to that as we um, get into introducing each one of our finalists. The way it's gonna go is the finalists have been um, categorized um, within three groups of, of finalists. And so I'll introduce the first group and then um, we will play a video of their work. And then it'll conclude with a short Q&A between me and, and the finalists. And then we'll go on to our second group and last but not least, our third group. 
of finalists, okay? So if you're ready for your first group of finalists, let me hear you say, yeah, in the chat, or woo, <laughs> show some love. Um, first up, we have Mahadur Akililu and Paula Escobar. Mahadur is a junior at Archbishop Midi High School, and Paula is a junior at Evergreen Valley High School. So right now we're gonna play both of their videos, but please show some love, y'all. Show some love right now to both Mahadur and Paula. Hi, my name is Mahadara Kalilu, and I'm a Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalist, and my poem is called Protest Poem. What will you say if you kill me? To those who hold the key to the cabinet with the silver spoons, yes, you, politician, my hopes and dreams, torn at the seams. Held up by fragile links, they chose guns over me. Money over my right to breathe. I need someone fighting for me in June. I developed a fear of the outside. Locked behind window sills, left with nothing but heartache. It was undercover cop cars where my feet strolled. Where I laughter echoed, marching feet brought beating hearts, beaten on, beaten tired but not broken. Caged, we broke out with torches that they'll try to dim. We are watching false promises, honey sweet, sink to the bottom of our tea. Lukewarm with anticipation, head spinning, waiting to stop at the finish line. Streets sprayed with stop signs, and it's time to tear them down. What will you say if you kill me? There will be riots every week before you take my hopes and dreams. Tear them at the seams. I am someone fighting for me. Let's make it a we. Hi everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Paula Escobar and I go by she, her pronouns. I'm a finalist for the Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate program and I'm super excited to be reciting in front of you all today. My poem is entitled, When I'm the Last One Here, and just to put it out there, there are um, just, a this just a mention of sexual violence slash violence against women. When I'm the Last One Here. Crumbling deception and mother nature are in the mountains, looking down the town where history center sphere and success follows concentration over inspiration. Use our stories, struggles, stresses, scuffles for your benefit, added on to the list of accolades reeking of missionary trips. My community is warped by a chain-linked border dividing two worlds the name of gratification and gentrification. But in the moment, I'm so happy to be in my mom's garden, where the dirt has dried up, but roses continue to sprout up from beaded rock, just as our abuelo promised us would happen. In my front yard, I can stand away from swallowing suburbs, tightening the grip on my throat and forcing me to drown. Cold modernism murder disguised as quick renovation, like slathering white paint over crafted murals, like demolishing my favorite floral store in downtown, convincing me I am as aggressive as the housing policies placed on us. However, my flowers give me hope. In slow outskirts, mother continues to unearth the remnants of seeds originally tucked in crinkled plastic, stored in withered cardboard for decades since the 80s, but now finally ready to flourish. The blossom roots are now grounded in a new home, away from their original Indian soil, a place where the air runs free and the hills roll alongside the wind. When cataclysmic Silicon Valley corporate complexities leave desolate corporate oil-spilled wasteland, come to push out torment in ash valleys, now here I sit with ripped violetas in my front yard, bitten quechua tongue, dirt and blood on my hands, remnants of a valley home stripped away for milliseconds, tantrum boils through my blood. Destruction of my neighborhood is my complicity. At least, that's what you have convinced me. 
I'm grasping for clarity, trauma seeped into my brain, when I'm the last one here, where can I go, sooty black hair, South American exotic, I have no way back to the pueblos back home, I'm just displaced and replaced, I have lost an entire language, I'm the femicide and screams of misogyny, I'm violence against women, I'm hate and you tell me this is all my fault. I'm just another keepsake and scapegoat of color, performative mementos marking that change has supposedly happened. I was promised things would be different. You have shredded the petals of my favorite violet, robbed my mother's folded dollars and rusted nickels for rent, culture extracted from community like liquid gold. When I'm the last one here, it will be too late. Your money cannot replace our values. Thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Please, please, please join me in giving it up for Mahadur and Paula, y'all. Those are just our first two finalists <laughs> and the fire is already here, y'all. Uh, I, I invite Mahadur and, and Paula to, to unmute and be here with me right now. Um, thank you so much for those um, incredible pieces. As I was listening to each of them, I'm still marinating on, on both of your words. I was reminded by something that Nina Simone had said around how the duty of the artist is to reflect the time. And you both did that so brilliantly in both of your pieces. And I thank you so much. And so with that, you know, I, as I was learning more about your work and, um, and more about your, your journey through this finalist process, I know that you both are involved in your own sense of activism in your life. And so I wanted to ask, what role do you think poets play in this movement towards social justice? What is the role of the artist to you in your life in this movement towards social justice? And either of you can answer first and then the, the next panelist can answer after. Um, yeah, hi, okay. Um, what poets, mean in activism, poetry, or even just art in general can symbolize the energy that you want political movements to have, can energize that energy, can um, create it, what, what, whether it's anger, love, compassion for the people around you, or even just education, educating people on the struggles of others through your words, showing them your emotions and how much things hurt you, like making people empathize and sympathize with political movements, just really, again, energizing. Um, <laughs> I think that poets specifically have had such a special role in um, crafting beautiful language that brings people around to listen and enjoy and take part in taking care of each other. And I really think that's what, that's what poetry's role or poets' roles in activism are. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for that incredible answer. Uh, Paula, how about you? What role do you think poets play in this movement around activism, social justice? Yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Paula Escobar. Uh, I'm really excited to be in front of you all today. And I really want to echo what Mahather just said, just about how act like poets really play a large movement like what a role in these movements because they're able to carry forward synergy from past generations like um pass down like the words carried down from them from previous people like people in their lives people in these similar activist movements that we've seen in the past and I think that's really powerful and indicative of how our fight is almost never ending in a way but nevertheless we still persist and with that I know like within my own work I always um go back to my roots I always kind of I'm in the perspective of I'm writing for my community I'm writing for my mother I'm writing for my older sister I'm writing for my grandmother I'm writing for all these different people who have made such a really break, great impact in my life and I think that just goes hand in hand with um how our own lived experiences really shape the way that we perceive the world and how we're perce perceived by others and I think both of these things really show um, the power our words have on other people, um, whether it's showing just how much we're impacted by everything going on in the world or showing our just like our 
raw emotion about something, I think that's truly touching and something unparalleled that you can't really do if you have like a scripted speech that we see a lot of politicians doing where they don't have any connection to their work. But having that real connection, I think, really resonates with people and um, being able to just sit in front of an audience like this and kind of speak your truth is just so moving and I think that really propels and really goes to show how powerful we are and especially as youth because um, for so long especially youth of color we're, we're not given this space or we're denied these platforms but the reality is we have so much to say we have so much ground to break and I think that comes with a responsibility of making sure that we are advocating on behalf of other youth of color and just giving back to our community and keeping forward what our ancestors and what our ancestors have been fighting for as well. Yes, yes, Paula, thank you so much. You're absolutely right. I, I was sitting here being reminded um, of, of the fact that poets have very specific roles in this movement and we always have, we've always been translators, articulators, um, prioritizing, you know, the importance of dreaming and imagining a, a better world than this, right? And so thank you all so much for speaking to, to those notions. Please, everyone who is joining us right now, please give all your love to Mahadur and Paula. Thank you so, so much. Before I introduce our next two finalists, I just want to share that um, the judges that have selected um, our Youth Poet Laureate for this year also selected a Vice Youth Poet Laureate. So at the end of our program, we'll be in introducing who both our Vice Youth Poet Laureate and Youth Poet Laureate for Santa Clara County will be. So this is super exciting and I'm ex I can't wait till we get to that portion. But until then, I want to introduce our next two Youth Poet Laureate finalists. We have Trisha Ayer and Swasti Jory. Swasti Jory is a junior at Evergreen Valley High School and Trisha Ayer is a ninth grader at the Harker School. So please show some love y'all and give it up for Trisha and Swasti as we share their videos. Hello, my name is Trisha Iyer and I am a Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalist. My poem is called Courting Adulthood. When I was barely in elementary school, I played basketball. No one would pass to me and my shots took too long. I quit before I got good enough to not care. Played like a basketball. And now I'm tough with a bumpy rind, a skin I grew that's hard. I'll smack you in your beating heart. I'm a frenzy on the court. I just go, go, go. So many hands reaching, grasping, slapping, stealing. I walked into that first meeting of Quiz Bowl, a sixth grader, with my cheeks like stewed brown apples, my eyes watering from the wall of testosterone, waiting to prove myself and assigned to the slot of literature expert. Because girls read books. And yes, I did. Buzz the Great Gatsby, Buzz Jane Austen, or Buzz <laughs> Simone de Beauvoir. But boys were the ones to know history and science. Me, I'm a precious commodity. I roll with the people who hustle, the perfect team, the ones with nimble fingers and louder voices, the best of flingers. They never let me roll on the ground. Though they used to, and I'd compare my battered brain to theirs and buckle down to study and teach them better. Comparing is the science of Venn diagrams, the domain of the logical, the art of sizing up which people fit together. It's the knowledge of what intersects and what is the norm and what is not. Which one is bigger, bad, or maybe better, A or B? During a game, I'm carried all around the world. I'm up and down and pounding the dirt ground as I go, 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 bounce back and forth, bouncing back up is something I learned from sitting on the floor, learning the metaphor is easier than the world. I can read all the books I get my hands on, and I've certainly tried to learn that there are some points that don't have a B. Some things can't be compared, like eyes. I can try and close them, find blindness like Buzz John Milton, but my red eyelid abyss and black infinity is not the same as yours, and when I open my eyes, they will still be wall-eyed. Staring up at the ceiling at first light, I couldn't find constellations for you in the cracks and bumps of the plaster, for it's all glossy gray to me. 
Some things can't be compared like hearts, like watching Lara Jean and Peter and wondering which half of the couple I want to be and who I want to love. Did everybody feel this way about their elementary school best friend? Or was it all in my head making up things not expected of me? I bounce from soft cradling hands to ones with strips of callous blister bands, the dusty dirt plumes up to meet me as I go, go, go. Some things can't be compared like you and me and the experiences you hold and the way they taught you to treat yourself and the memories I hold inside me like a Russian doll in carefully contained layers that you can count past as I grow to love and know you as a friend. But like the sheriff and Homer Price, there is a walnut at the center of my ball of yarn and I don't know what to do with it. So yes, I am flawed, but I am not your cracked pottery to fix or manic pixie dream girl to tame. I am just over here finding my own way, fighting in the corner to be hurt. Sometimes fighting the air for the struggle of life, swept up in my own flurry of motion. I reach new heights, new hits, slam the backboard down through the net, a symphony of noises, a perfect soundtrack when I go, go, go. My own deep thumps, big bass sounding through the hollow core, staccato of percussion, accompanied by the trills and frills and thrills of success. I stack up each victory as the dominoes, skyscrapers, stamped black dots on white, a moat of frame certificates of royal purple ribbons. I come of age surrounded by walls plastered with achievements to tuck my self-worth under, to affirm to myself, they all think they own me and they don't. In the moment at the top of my arc toward the hoop, my X velocity is zero. So says my physics teacher. And I'm only now learning to stop wanting to burst and struggle with life, to just be, to exist, caught in between being what I want and molding myself into the negative spaces of societal expectations. The court is my home and I spin my identity out over it, this place where I was born to go, go, go. I can halt myself to breathe, to just be, to exist but won't let anyone else do that to me, doubting, frowning, wagging their fingers, stalling me, but not stopping me. I feel just my age and my yearn for life in each pulsing layer, groaning, growing to a place they'll soon see. They treasure so something so much, but try to smash it on the ground, let it dribble from your hands? No. What are they, my quiz bowl teammates, now that I'm the captain, the critics that I'm too girly when I know that's not a flaw, even the Adam and Stevers trying to tie down love? What are they going to do about it? Thank you. I want. I wonder. Sometimes I wish I were white like paper so you could bear to see all my lines. See my work made with the pencil of life because black shows up better on white. Because the intricacies of my existence remain too complex for your persistence. Easy to ignore the inequalities experienced by too many they see women. The fear in which I live, knowing the gait of my aunts and sisters and cousins in my mother's nation run the risk of ignorant annihilation. Groped and grabbed and maligned, also one man can feel like a mastermind. See, if I were white, he would notice the shake, 
The line's not quite straight. The mark's not black, but gray because I'm afraid. See, if I were white, I'd have no inhibition. You'd force me not into submission, but nurture my suspicions. Not rooted in hate for a single human, but for society compelling people like me to be bystanders. See, sometimes I wish I were white, not because I hate my culture, not because I haven't felt racial pressure, but so my non-existent might, my deafening cries, could receive an ounce of love and care, be fondled and coddled, not seen as disgruntled and something to be dismantled, so my suntan was not a fire to set alight, so the hair on my body was a reason for pride blooming from tiny bubbles on my skin so each follicle wouldn't bring me shame so each follicle wasn't something i try so hard to tame so to take the pain of razor burns burns from the white man's mouth about smells both he and i produce were it more wrong for escaping my body god it's so simple sometimes i wish i were white so on tv i could see another me so I was more than just your nerdy best friend. So you could see me without glasses and think, God, she has brains and beauty. So I had the right to have dimension. So I wouldn't approach my many labels with apprehension. So I wouldn't recoil in fear when I sense my culture near. No, I do not wish I were white. I simply wonder wonder in a world where the voice of another color is torn asunder. Ooh, wow, y'all. Please show some love and give it up for Trisha and Swasti as they join me on this virtual stage. Please, please, please. Thank you, Trisha and Swasti, for your incredible work. If you are in this live and you're resonating with anything the poets are saying, please highlight it in the chat feature. Say what's resonating for you. Give, give love as best as you can. Um, thank you all both for being here with us tonight. Um, I remember as I was reading your bios, um, you both had expressed using poetry as a way to explore deeper emotions that you experience personally, as well as a way to foster empathy and hope. And I wanted to ask each of you, what do you think it is about the power of poetry that makes it possible for us to explore these emotions that all of us experience? Why do you think people turn to poetry to explore them? So what do you think it is about the power of poetry that makes it possible for us to explore these emotions? And why do you think people turn to poetry to explore them? Of all other art forms, why poetry? And so I'll open it up for either of you to to answer it and then the, the other finalists will follow after. Um, yeah, my, I can go first. Uh, so what I think is so interesting about poetry is that uh, when you take prose as its point of contrast with prose, it's like every English essay you think back on that you've written or every response to a history DBQ. There are rules, there are complete sentences. You have to write in paragraphs, Times New Roman, double spaced, 12 point font. It's so many rules and these blocks of text. It's just, you pound it out and there's one way to do it. But with poetry, you can do it in any way you like. It's really amorphous and it kind of molds to fit your needs. Like there are certain like forms, you know, a, B, A, B stanzas, rhyme schemes, there are sonnets. You can write any form of poetry you want. There are structures, but you get to choose the structure. And there is that agency that kind of gives you the power to choose how you want to move and arrange those words on the page. And um, for me, poetry is really dynamic. It's really gripping. I think one poet who does it really well is um, Victoria Chang, and it's just her her words are so dynamic and they just compel your eye to keep moving across the page. And I think that's wonderful because that's really the energy and spirit of poetry that it kind of moves on the page and it moves into you and makes you feel something in a very concentrated way. Thank you, Trisha, for that. Poetry moves on the page is reverberating for me because I, I completely agree. <laughs> so thank you for naming that. Swasti, how about you? So 
I think um, a lot of like different themes that I explore with my per- my poetry personally is the chaos that just seems to permeate every crevice of the world in a very literal sense. Like we see in the news, we see a lot of quite literal violence, but also this very serious, like not talked about um, almost mental health crisis that we as a country are undergoing. Um, So I think what poetry allows us to do is to be able to explore the intersection of both of those very different types of chaos that exist. Um, It's not really bound by any particular emotion. It's not really bound by happiness. It's not bound by joy. Uh, There's no expectations for you to impress anyone when you write a poem, which I think is very important for an art form to have the ability to do something that I think um, poetry does perfectly. I mean, generally, when we do work, we want the best outcome. We want the best outcome for whoever we prepare it for. But because poetry isn't really bound to anyone, um, it's just you and the paper. It's you and the structure of the poem. It's you and what you want to write. Um, It can be very impactful and it can be very personal. Also, what I believe is that it's, it doesn't really have to do with a language. It doesn't really have to do with English either. Um, It can be in whatever language. It can sound however you want which I think just the flexibility that that allows for people to explore topics that aren't talked about or people are afraid to talk about. I think that is also just extremely powerful. Um, Yeah, so that's why I think, that's why I try to explore with my poetry. And that's why I generally think it's an art form that needs to be spread to the youth more, um, that you can, that it allows you to talk about the sad parts of life. It allows you to do sad things without being bound to making anyone else in your life happy, which isn't, um, which isn't offered to most people at any point in their life. Yeah, absolutely. Swasti, Trisha, thank you so, so very much for joining us. Please y'all give it up, show some love for Trisha and Swasti, two of our Youth Poet Laureate finalists. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I'm, my, I'm feeling a lot of things right now. <laughs> um, I hope for everyone who's tuning in and paying attention that you are listening to our young folks, um, not just their poetry, but every word they're saying is a gift right now to all of us, um, that it, it is a charge to all of us adults. It is a charge to all of us organizers um, to really reckon with what will it take to continue to foster and cultivate and protect these spaces for our young people who are saying, we need more of these spaces. We need more of passing the mic to them. We need more of them to be integral parts to our, 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 our programs and our events and not just ornamental and not just a side thought and not just um, margin, at the margins of what we do. They are, they are essential to who we are. So thank you so much. If you're ready for your next set of finalists, let me hear you say yes in the chat. <laughs> I can't see the chat. I'm just trusting that you're here with me, that y'all got me, that you're just interacting with me. I see the lovely people, all the finalists and all the judges <laughs> in the Zoom with me, but I trust that you're out there. Um, next up, we have Jasmine Kapadi, uh, sorry, Jasmine Kapadia and Avalon Felice Lee. Jasmine is a junior at Palo Alto senior high school and Avalon is a junior at Notre Dame high school so please give it up as we watch Jasmine Avalon's videos give it up give it up give it up hi my name is Jasmine Kapadia and I'm a Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalist my poem is in response to Ellie Wiesel's night I'd like to give a content warning for material related to the holocaust This is the moment skeletons become atheists. Gold lodged in the back of throats and stuck, rigor mortis like you never had a chance. And maybe the soup tastes like corpses, or maybe the soup tastes like God, 
or like angels and cracks in the barbed wire because skeleton is a synonym for survivor. In other words, you are the last one standing. In other words, where is your body? Today, the soup tastes like God, a fire, the only thing stronger than hatred, a fire, the only thing stronger than railroad tracks, a fire, madness, a fire, family, a fire, if it is delusion to think this sculpture hasn't dried yet, this clay hasn't been consumed, broken glass, or crowbars, does that make faith strong enough to convince yourself? Does that make remorse strong enough to forgive yourself? Is there anything to forgive yourself for? A can of worms. Hope. Fire. The warm kind. Soup is thicker today. The bombs are bright in the sky. If you squint, they look like stars. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Avalon Fleece Lee. I am a Santa Clara Ooh. County. Ooh. Sorry about that, everyone. We're going to fix that. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Avalon Fleece Lee. I am a Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalist, and I'll be reading my poem called The Growing Blue. A Glock 22 articulates an entire sentence, and America ends another in the wrong place, wrong time, wrong color and sometimes it's easiest on the periphery our shadows failing even us we the people was a birthright assured as long as this earth was underfoot and fertile still as long as we verbalize our reverence for this motherland as long as our hands are sure as we serve these borders. But decades have decayed, and still this democracy diminishes us into an afterthought. We ask ourselves if she will not stand for us, why should we stand for her? Yet a Glock 22 shot straight through a small boy who did everything you're supposed to do and a knee on neck used minutes to crush 46 years and still it's the wrong place, wrong time, wrong color and still we stand still because we would rather fail in the footnotes than take an honest stand in the eclipse of crosshairs ellipses slipping from our lips every silence a yes like how the open air permits a bullet and another ends but tomorrow still believes in today and maybe if we gave up gravity to rise beside those not guaranteed theirs we could own the sky the growing blue of every bruised right of the wronged. The afterthoughts. The thought of an after is imminent enough to witness if only we jettison our hesitance to recite our birthright and rise before the infinite eye of hindsight. We can redefine we as a definite synonym of we, the people, must mind the people who stand by, horrified each time we amplify this appetite for our American right to would rather us parasites out of sight, divided and silenced because they were never on our side in this lifetime fight for we, the people, 
can personify the preamble's line that emphasizes every rhyme of a more perfect union that begins with we the people when you let your being here revolutionize enough sunlight to fill our being here every raw boned and othered shadow must unite to ignite the loudest dark because america was never quite the right reason but a brother is Woo! Please, y'all, help in joining me and giving it up for Jasmine and Avalon. Show some love in the chat right now. Please, 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 as they join me on our virtual stage. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Avalon. Hello. Um, hi. Thank y'all so much. I was, I was hanging on every word. The way y'all do language um, was just so vivid um, that you were doing more than just telling us a poem you were showing us and you were, you were taking us on journeys through your work. And I really appreciate that and, and thank y'all. Um, both of you use language as a way to explore what is oftentimes difficult to articulate, um, but you also use language to highlight what stories have been silenced and deserve a chance to be brought to light. So I wanna ask, what do you feel is at stake if you don't speak up and write your stories through your poetry? What would happen? And I invite either one of you to start and then the other one can go after and I'll reiterate, what do you feel is at stake if you don't speak up and write your stories, write your truths through your poetry and what, what would happen? Um, I think for me, uh, I am a mixed Asian American. I say it every time anyone asks me about my poetry. I'm Indian American and I'm Chinese American. And um, I think my poetry is first and foremost a way for me to present those identities without sort of owing anyone an explanation. Um, I can sort of just exist in my ethnicity, exist in my culture, um, and not explain anything. If I want to incorporate Chinese into a poem, um, I don't have to italicize anything. Um, I don't have to separate it. And I think that sort of, if I didn't write poetry, um, I wouldn't feel as comfortable with my identities as I am now. Um, because of my mixed identity, it's sort of hard sometimes to feel not, um, to feel like I am allowed to take up space in my communities because there's always a sense of like, oh, I'm not a hundred percent part of this community, even though I am being mixed doesn't make you any less. Um, and I think also just from writing my perspective and my experiences, I've learned that my community will naturally flock to that and I think I don't have to put crazy pressure on myself to represent my entire um, AAPI community, but just from telling my story, it helps maybe some other kids um, feel seen, maybe some other you know, Asian American who wants to write poetry, um, but isn't quite sure how to do it. Just because I write and maybe they see a poem that I've written, they feel like they can as well. And so I think even though poetry um, is a very selfish thing for me and my poetry is a very selfish thing for me um, in the sense of I'm creating my own space and I'm writing primarily to create that space just for me, um, my community uh, finding it and flocking towards it makes it um, very important that I continue to because if I don't, um, I, I think it would be one less voice and um, we need all the voices we can. We need all the representation we can get. Yes, I co-sign on everything you just said, Jasmine. Thank you for articulating it in the way you just did um, and, and really mapping out the cost of staying silent or the cost of not speaking your truth. Thank you. Um, Avalon, I invite you to answer as well. What, what do you feel is at stake if you don't speak up and write your, your truths, your stories through your poetry? What would happen? Well, just broadly speaking, you know, I've always seen poetry as a way to reach out to other people and you know, when I think of a poet, I think of someone who holds a certain subset um, of issues and concerns close to their heart and who through the power of poetry carves out their own seat at the table to articulate all of our cares and anxieties about 
you know, where we will be in a decade or where we are now, um, who can translate our emotions into words and these words back into emotion, um, who through the power of spoken can bring these issues that are close to our hearts to light and to life. Um, and also to people who may not know or understand. And when these people do not hear what we care about, you know, these people, they're also our future and they also need to know if they don't, our future is at stake. You know, poetry, which I th I've always thought is not heard or read, but felt can speak to so many willing hearts. Yes, Avalon, thank you so much. Thank you both. Can, can everyone please join me in giving up for Avalon and Jasmine one time, two of our other amazing Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalists. Thank you both so much. Whew. Let me take a breather. Um, this is incredible, y'all. We have one more group of finalists that I am so happy to introduce. Um, if you're ready to hear who they are, let me hear you say yee in the chat. <laughs> I really hope y'all are with me. <laughs> so last but not least, we have Sarah Fatima Mohammed, Anna Yang, and Anuk Ye. Sarah is a sophomore at the Harker School. Anna is a sophomore at Notre Dame High School. And Anuk is a junior at Saratoga High School. So please give it up. Help me show some love for Sarah, Anna, and Anuk as we share their work in video. Hi, my name is Sarah Fatima Mohammed, and I am a Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalist. My poem is titled, Go Back to Your Country, The White Boy Spits, and I would like to provide a trigger warning for violence. Go back to your country, the white boy spits, and he yanks the lunch money from my curled hand. He reeks of grease, sweat. My hands are empty. His hands are full, red and meaty, swathed in calluses. Sometimes I feel small and wilting. Sometimes I feel like a bruise, a dark expanse of hurt. Is this what this country has left behind for my people? Is this our plot of land, these stains of violence? At night, my grandmother calls me from the village. I miss her. We pray together. My tumble clumsy, hers crisp. The Quran, a soft thing slathered on our tongues like ghee, perhaps like a song, perhaps like someone's kindness. Through the telephone static, I hear a man's shout, go back to your country, he roars in tumble. And my grandmother swallows her prayer, trembling, the sound of a gunshot hurtles across the telephone cord. She tells me outside her home there are men who want our people gone. I imagine them gathering, waving their saffron Hindu flags. We don't belong here, she murmurs, voice stretching with sadness. During the partition, they told my grandmother's mother to leave India, the place of her birth, the country where her people settled. My grandmother's mother hid in the village harvest shed for weeks, telling the story of her mother. My grandmother means to say we never belonged here, means to say we don't belong anywhere. The boy says, go back to your country, but I don't have a country. I don't end the phone call with my grandmother. The two of us sleep curled around the telephone wire, curled around each other. Hi, my name is Anna Yang and I'm a Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalist. Today I'll be reading my poem, Catalyst. 2020, I live like yesterday. The same spiraling hum ringing in my ears from the moment I awaken. It's inescapable, the light streaming through cracks in the window when mom forces them open. Sickening stench wafting from the kitchen trash can dirty laundry piling up in a corner of the closet, unwashed dishes still soiled with last night's dinner. Noon already, noon already, noon already. 
but every day will be the same. I saw you the times I blacked out only to be surrounded by white walls and picket fences. I can feel the clock ticking in the gut of the earth, but you leave me no choice but to ignore and live on, waiting to survive. 2020, you make me feel sane or insane, I can't tell. You surround me with the people who see me for who I truly am, the ones who cradle me and breastfed me and taught me to act human, human, human. Family created me, but you, 2020, have shaped me into an isolated speck, the most fragile part of you. How I barely escaped the weight of a cough across six feet, a replacement for the daily illusion of 15 pounds strapped to my back, tripping on linoleum flooring. And after the stars dissolve in the fiery smog, you will watch us when the curtain falls and fire explodes and the symbols crash counting down from 10, nine, eight, seven, six. I laugh and wave goodbye, move on to the next act. Who stands in the audience? 2020, you seduce me with your words. Hands up, don't shoot. Yellow peril supports black power. White silence is violence. No justice, no peace, just words. How they return home from school with nothing but scraped knees and bruised foreheads, denied of their books by teachers because they are illiterate and the words are and always will be meaningless. A zip code. The five digits that determine the value of a life. Did you, 2020, intend for my life to be greater than hers? She who was silenced when her vacant body was pushed to the floor because of her identity, zip code, female, immigrant, BIPOC, low income, uneducated. You ask questions and I'm searching for truth from a sea of answers. Who is to blame? Corporations? Politics? Systemic oppression? Me? I am nothing more than collateral damage. 2020, my youth is poisoned. Our legacy is stained at the hands of sworn protectors of the law and a virus takes the breath, breath, breath. From thousands of helpless corpses piled along heaven's gate, all strangers march for nail salons on Capitol Hill, ignoring the masses of weeping widows and orphans bowed at their feet. You shock me with injustices poking at privileged lenses as I turn away from the news reporting another death, another number. But the names play over and over in my head to the rhythm of your clock making a tempo in my chest. 2020, I fell asleep in your arms again. Use your heartbeat to match my own, your comforting embrace like those of a childhood long forgotten. But how many tick, tick, tick before the lullaby goes quiet. You refuse to answer, only hold my head against your shoulder and force me to wait another day. Hi, my name is Anukia and I'm a finalist for Santa Clara County's Youth Poet Laureate Program. And this is my poem, Color Wheel Connotations. My art teacher, ever the whimsic, tells me that colors are just complex emotions. Running her fingers along the edge of the color wheel, she tells me that colors convey emotions, and that just like every good Taylor Swift lyric, depending on colors, interpretations will change. My art teacher floods her canvas with red, says red by itself is angry, but red, drizzled with passion fruit orange and tinted with yellow, is a glowing sunset smile. My art teacher says that depending on colors, interpretations will change. Like how purple and silver together is Europe in the Middle Ages, but silver on gold is San Francisco circa 1849. Like how black and yellow is a bop, but black and blue is a bruise. My art teacher says that depending on colors, interpretations will change. Like how black on white is classy, but black on black is ghetto. Like how gun on white is patriot, but gun on color is terrorist. Like how crime on white is mental illness, but crime on color is still terrorist. Depending on colors, interpretations will change. So in the courtroom, when they arm up to paint with subdued hues and royal blues, I know they are painting an inherent eulogy. 
So in the courtroom, when they arm up to paint with pastels and white tinted pigments, I know they are painting a soft sentence where the canvas is the accused, the gavel, the brush, and the colors. The colors, the verdict. Depending on colors, interpretations will change. On the color wheel, any phrase, any sentence can be manipulated at the flick of a tongue. Thank you. Yo, wow. <laughs> please, y'all, if you haven't already started, please show some love. Give all of your love to Sarah, Anna, and Anouk as they help and join me on our virtual stage so we can highlight them. Hi, y'all. Hi, Sarah. Anna, Anouk. Y'all are incredible. <laughs> wow. Thank y'all so much for being part of this program and just being your brilliant selves and, and for putting out the work that you have right now into the world. It's so needed. Each of your voices are so needed. Um, I know from, from reading your bios and also checking out your work that all of you have such inspiring reasons of why you started writing poetry and became a poet in your own right. Uh, from exploring your personal identities to languaging the turmoil of the world we live in, you all use poetry as a vehicle for resilience, for reflection, and for reclamation. So I wanna ask, what advice would you give to other youth who are contemplating whether or not they should speak their truth and write their stories? What advice would you give to youth who doubt that their voice even matters? So I invite anyone to start and then we'll, we'll go to the next finalist and then the, the last finalist. Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, I think for me, like poetry was a way to like definitely grapple with my identity um, and especially growing up in like a more conservative Muslim family, knowing that like finding my voice. And so I think I would tell people that like we all belong in this space um, and that poetry is like, like open and is like there for us. Um, and it's not really, I don't know, there's no like entry password or like key that you need. And it's like, anyone can sort of like be and like play in this space. Um, and I would also say like, don't take yourself too seriously. Like it's okay to just like write what you want to write. Um, as I know for me, I like, I think when I started, I felt like a lot of pressure to, like I think Jasmine was saying earlier, like representing like the Muslim American community. Um, but just knowing that like, it's also okay to just like have poetry as a space to like play and like be there. Um, and so I think I would tell people who are like doubting or like uncertain that like you don't need, like poetry doesn't need to be serious and like it can be if you want to, um, but it can also just be like like a space where there's no limit and where you can just like, like come and like be with other people and be with the page. Absolutely, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. I love that you named, you know, there, there's no passcode to this. There's no rigid structure that you have to abide by necessarily. You get to play, you get to be, you get to be free in it. And so thank you for sharing that. Who would like to go next? I can go. Um, I love everything that Sarah said. I totally agree with everything. Um, I can add that, like, sometimes poetry can be really daunting because, like, um, there's, like, no good poetry or no bad poetry just like any poetry that tells your story that tells your perspective on the world is good poetry and like I think that's something that's amazing about poetry for me because like in writing there's like a rubric usually and poetry like you can just say what you want with your own words and like you can even use a different language and everybody will just have to accept your own perspective. Yes, Anna you said every every poetry that tells your story is good poetry. It's something that is going to stick with me <laughs> moving forward. Thank you for sharing that. Anuk, how about you? Yeah, I definitely agree with what Sarah and Anna have been saying about how accessible poetry is. And I think um, when I was starting out, a really good piece of advice that one of my friends had um, like gave me was that like as a writer, it feels like 
like Anna was saying, it feels really daunting when you kind of step out and you're like feeling out what your voice is like for the first time in terms of poetry. But um, I think it's always important to know that you always have like a really strong community behind you. I think whether or not you know it, there are in the less, least creepiest way possible, there are always people like watching and cheering you on whether you know it or not. And I think that's like a really big, I think piece of advice that's helped me a lot. And I'd say like, just to testify to how true that is, I'd say like the reason that I started writing poetry um, was actually because of, um, at the time this person was just like a youth poet who just had their video posted on YouTube, like had around a hundred views. But I remember watching that video and being like, oh my God, this, you know, this person who's only like a few years older than me, not some like crazy famous poet or anything like, his words really resonated me, with me. And that's what I think made me start to write. So I think as a young person, one, it's important to know that you always have a community behind you, but also two, I think even though it might not feel like you have that much influence, like maybe you're not like Ocean Vuong or Victoria Chang, um, but there are always like other people that you're going to aspire, inspire other young people, especially, because I think um, there's, really the sense of connection between young people when you see someone your age speaking their truth you're like wow I want to do that I want to be like that so I'd say those are my two main pieces of advice yes Anuk a hundred percent co-sign on that thank you so much for bringing in that element of yeah communities here we got you <laughs> like when you're ready to tell your story when you're ready for support um, it's so important to remember that you're not alone in this journey um, so thank you for sharing that. Thank you to each and every one of y'all. Please help me show some love for Sarah, Anna, and Anup, y'all. Give it up for all of the last three of our finalists. And keep that love going because that was all of our finalists. Please, please, please show some love for each and every finalist that um, touched the stage here today. Because now we are moving into the direction of who will be announced as our 2021 Vice Youth Poet Laureate, as well as our 2021 Youth Poet Laureate. But before that, I want to just give love and appreciation to all of our judges that help make this selection process possible. Judges for the program are community members who are leaders in the local poetry and writing community and are invested in education, activism, community organizing, and especially youth development. Our judges also ensure that we selected students that represent the program's values of civic engagement, literary excellence, social impact, as well as social justice. And so I want to personally thank each and every one of these judges as I introduce each of them. I wanna thank Lindsay Kuto Mohammed, who is a Santa Clara High School English teacher. Thank you for being a judge this year. I wanna thank Poliana Idizari, who's a librarian and co-founder of South Bay DIY Zine Collective. Thank you for offering your time to being a judge for our Youth Poet Laureate commencement ceremony. I want to thank Sajid Khan, who is a Santa Clara County alternate public defender. Thank you so much for your time and for being a judge with us. I want to thank Quinn Mai Nguyen, a community organizer, social artist, and poet. Thank you, Quinn Mai, for being here with us. Thank you, Ma Matt Ogawa, who is a member of San Jose Taiko and works at Facebook Human Resources. Thank you, Matt, for your time and for being a judge with us. I wanna thank Yossi Mar Reyes, who is a fellow poet and public speaker. Yossi, thank you so much for being a judge with us. And last but not least, I wanna thank Landon Smith, who is a poet and professor at Chabot College. Thank you so much, Landon, for being a judge with us. Um, so plot twist, I'm not even gonna announce who the Youth Poet Laureate is. I'm actually gonna hand it over to one of our fellow judges, who is an incredible nationally acclaimed poet public speaker, um, homie, <laughs> um, one of the South Bay's finest, East San Jose represent all day, okay? Um, please give it up for Yossi Mar Reyes as they will be the one who announces our Vice Youth Poet Laureate and Youth Poet Laureate. Yes. Buenas noches, everybody. I'm so excited to be here and you don't know how like 
just thrilled I am to kind of, I think this is full circle. You know, I think for me, I started doing poetry at 16 through the Mock Latin pro, uh, Poetry Program. And since then, I think a poetry has definitely shaped in my life, has changed my perspective, has definitely influenced where I envision and what I've manifested in my life. So I'm so grateful to be part of this process and then to just be a witness to all your brilliance and just, you know, be in community with all of you. Um, the process was definitely very challenging as you are all demonstrated a high caliber and definitely just your portfolios and your recommendation letters. I think it just display um, just what, you know, our country needs. And I think if anything, that is like the, the thing, the hope that I have, right, is that, you know, there's people that you are in the world and you're participating in shifting narratives and creating new narratives. And I think that's what's really, really exciting about um, bearing witness to this program. Um, the role, uh, like I said, of the, uh, of the uh, Poet Laureate is one that you will be defining and you will be creating, right, from your personal experience and anecdotes and being in community with other young people and other young poets. You have the ability to imagine and create something that hasn't really existed. So I think even the possibilities of you bearing the torch and that this is the first time, I think it's really, really monumental. So uh, congratulations to all of you that participated. And now I have the really, really difficult task of announcing um, this, uh, the, the award. So we're going to start off with the Vice um, Youth Poet Laureate. And this person demonstrated, um, I think it stood out to all of us in, in the work. And, I, and we're really, really excited that um, this person is joining us today. So please clap it up for the 2021 Vice uh, Poet Laureate of Santa Clara County being Mahadur Akhlilu. So please clap it up for <laughs> Mahadur. Yes. <laughs> And I don't know if you want to say some words. <laughs> um, hi, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm just, <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm taking it in a little bit. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope I will be able to make you all proud and thank you all so much again. I'm sorry, I'm words. <laughs> I'm gonna end it there, thank you. Thank you so much. And you already are, honestly, you are already doing the work and you're already kind of, you know, inspiring all of us uh, with your poetry and your work. And I think in collaboration with uh, the Youth Poet Laureate, both, uh, I think it's a beautiful partnership of crafting something. And it, knows, and it goes without saying that all of you are young women of color who are bearing the torch. And this is what is the most amazing thing because this is what's going to change, you know, the, the paradigm of this country right you were only going to continue shifting and dreaming new possibilities so i think this is why i'm super super excited to be part of this process um and now for the youth poet laureate of santa clara county uh, da -da -da -da, this is so nerve-wracking um please help me in welcoming your 2021 youth poet laureate of santa clara county which is anuk yay so please clap it up for Anouk, who's definitely, we love her work, demonstrated a high caliber and congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, we love you. We love you. We love you. And we're so excited to see what you can dream of. Oh my God. Sorry. I'm like crying now. <laughs> um, but oh my God, I'm so honored. And I like just wanted to say, I guess even before my con I continue, like, the rest of the nine finalists like I know we've like talked about this so much at our previous reading but these are like the nine people that I feel like in terms of like a writing space I feel like closest to and I'm just so grateful to have had like gone through this experience with everyone and I love you guys so much that's like first of all um but I also wanted to say that this feels really full circle because I don't know if I've talked about it before but um like one of the very first open mics I've ever attended was at Live Lit hosted by Mighty Mike. And it was one of the first times I'd ever performed. And I remember like, um, like Mike, like 
like introducing me up to the stage and me being super like nervous and then everyone in the crowd just being like it's okay and I think like I feel like I've grown up in like the Santa Clara like poetry and art scene and I'm just really honored and I really hope like Mahadur said that I can make everyone proud and I hope to represent um, this community as best as I can and thank you guys so much. Thank you. And I think for everybody, for all the finalists, I think this is just know that we are all in community together. And it's interesting, Teresa, you know, how we all just continue to kind of orbit around each other. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about being in poetry in this poetry community is that we can all kind of celebrate our wins because when I see Teresa win, I feel like I'm winning. When we see each other win, I think it's a collective win. So just know that we're in this together. So muchas gracias. Thank you everybody for uh, being part of this experience. Thank you, Yossi, so much. Please, y'all, please, can we give it up one more time for our 2021 Vice Youth Poet Laureate and Youth Poet Laureate, Anuk, yeah, Mahader. Give it up, y'all. My goodness. And also, please keep showing love for every single one of our finalists. Every single one of our finalists has been so essential to the point we keep making about how much we are a community in this. So I want folks to give love to Paula. I want folks to give love to Trisha. I want folks to give love to Swasti, to give love to Jasmine, to give love to Avalon, to give love to Sarah, to give love to Anna too, y'all. Um, we need y'all. <laughs> we still need your voices. We still need your leadership. We still need your, your commitment to this art form through our community. Um, and Yossi was right. Um, so much of why I like jumped at the chance to say yes to hosting this was because Janice is my sister. <laughs> You'll see his family, like Matt, like Mike McGee, like so many folks on this call. I'm like, of course, <laughs> like say less. <laughs> um, and that's what it's been in terms of what's been powering this community um, in terms of really showing up and supporting, and especially at this point, supporting our young people. Um, with, this, uh, with this Youth Poet Laureate um, position, um, the Youth Poet Laureate, our, our Anukye, receives a $1,000 scholarship. What? Uh, you receive a chapbook publication, um, and you also receive support to work on a poetry project of your choice. So please give it up one more time for our 2021 Youth Poet Laureate Anukye, y'all. Um, before we close out, I want to call back uh, Jan Janice uh, to make a few more announcements. Um, and, and close this out properly as our 2021 Youth Poet Laureate, Adult Youth Poet Laureate. Give it up for Janice, y'all. Hi, everyone. Wow, thank you everybody for being a part of this. Um, I'm gonna continue crying when this is over, um, just to affirm all of the overwhelming feelings of gratitude and love and support and community and poetry. Um, I'm really excited um, to work with Mahadur and Anouk and also like all of you, right? Like all of the finalists, like please let us hold you and just know we see you. And um, I'm still going to email you <laughs> and I hope that's okay. I will check in on you. Um, yeah, I... I'm really like really grateful and honored to be the Poet Laureate um, for 2020 to 2021, which means I have a little over half a year left in my position. Um, and although I was asked to do another year because of the pandemic and, um, you know, just like wanting to make sure I'm like out in community, I really do feel that I have been out and with community um, online, which is where everyone sort of is these days. And so um, I unfortunately declined um, the opportunity to do this for a third year. Um, and I don't know, I want to like continue to like keep writing. I want to continue to hopefully like one day, I don't know, have a family. Um, so I need to like plan to do that. And um, I just want to say like this position, my position will be open um, hopefully in the fall. And I encourage more people to please apply and to start thinking about it. Um, and I would love to talk to anyone who has any questions about it because anyone can can do this however you want to do it. Um, I know that I've asked a uh, former poet laureate, Mike McGee, for a lot of help. And Mike has been amazing in supporting. And I want to do what Mike did for me for future poets laureate. Um, so 
please don't be like heartbroken. There is no heartbreak. I'm still around. <laughs> I'm still here. Um, and I hope that we can all continue to connect. So please like look forward to all of the features of all of these finalists. Um, and hopefully we will have more youth writing workshops and projects to come in the fall. So look out for that. I'll email all of you, I'm sure. Thank you again. Thank you so much for being here, truly. I will pass it back to Teresa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. And just please give it up, give it a round of applause and give all your love to every single person who made this program possible, to our judges, to, our, to all of the organizations, to the cultural centers, to all of the individuals who made this happen um, for our, our youth to have a, a platform um, deserving of their talent, of their excellence, of their leadership. We need them so desperately. <laughs> um, and so to close us out, I thank you all for letting me host tonight. It's been really amazing. I'm so inspired to step my game up in terms of my writing <laughs> and, and my goals as a writer, as an artist, but more importantly, as a community member in this community here in the South Bay, in the Bay Area. And so um, I end this night with a poem. Um, I, there's so much to be said about what I believe the role of the artist is in our community. Um, but so much of what I enjoy about this art form, more than performing, more than writing, is being with young people, is teaching, is creating curriculum, is supporting our youth. And so I just thank you so much for even having me be with you tonight. And um, this is my last poem. It begins with a quote. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Lucille Clifton. I'm still alive because I'm not afraid of what I already know wants to kill me. Because I'm a first generation queer Samoan woman Four chapters of a survivor story excavated from my bones. The reason your oppression doesn't know what to shoot first. I'm still alive because they C-section me out of my mother's middle in spite of knowing my gender. They think that blood is the only thing a woman loses the moment she gives birth to a girl. My gender never belonged to itself. When it's raped, America does this funny thing where it tells me I was asking for it at the same time that it tells me to stay silent. The hemline of my skirt is an overactive jury that treats my body like a courtroom, that treats my voice box like a closet, that they say I deserve to die in on the floorboards of my sins because I fell in love with a woman made an altar of her body since no one else ever has. I'm still alive because everyone deserves to be treated like a holy offering, a sacred thing it is, y'all, to find and know God in the last place homophobia would ever think to look a backdoor into heaven after being put through hell for having the faith of a faggot, a dyke for a daughter, the names your community calls you in a language that isn't the one that they immigrated here with. I'm still alive because most days, y'all, I let the trauma write all of my poems because saying them out loud on stage is the first step towards getting help because I trust a microphone on a mic stand in a room full of strangers before I'll ever trust the police. This stage is both sanctuary and emergency room. My people are both griots and doctors and patients with no patients left in them. Just stories with skin, too dark for sympathy because no one ever considers our pain in American tragedy. I'm still alive because I watch Oakland every day pick itself up from its own concrete, scrub the blood out its cracks before the new neighbors arrive on blocks that their mortgage used to own a white hipster's wet dream next to a BART station that Oscar's daughter, Nia's father will never have the stomach to take. I'm still alive because mm. no one needs to see that there is no difference between Iraq and East Oakland, Southside Chicago and South Central, a battalion of young soldiers and the students in my poetry workshop, how no one has mornings like them, how they wake up in their own piss and grief to go to another friend's funeral more times than they even go to class. How the biggest fear for most of my friends is to raise a black child in a justice system of a joke that will continue to say taser when we kept saying gun, that will continue to cry acquittal when we kept crying murder, that will continue to sing God bless America when we kept saying God please <laughs> have mercy on all of us. I'm still alive y'all because in the past decade we've lost Nelson Mandela, Amiri Baraka, Maya Angelou, 
Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Yuri Kochiyama, Grace Lee Boggs, Afeni Shakur, Prince, Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, Intasake Shange, Nipsey Hussle, Teresia Tewa, Toni Morrison. And upon learning of all of their passings, I hung my poetry at half mass. We artists of the revolution know that we are on borrowed time using borrowed words, watching our leaders turn ancestor in our life. I'm still alive y'all because whatever wants me dead doesn't know that you can't kill somebody who isn't afraid anymore. Somebody who is ready to leave this place an ancestor. Somebody who is ready to give birth to the generation that will bring about the liberation I was always destined to make, but never meant to see. Thank y'all so much for being with us. Please give it up one more time for all of our Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate finalists. Have a good night, be well, support youth poetry, uh, and, and, and take care. See y'all later. <laughs>